Final Fantasy VII. We're 10 seconds into the video, and some of you are already typing your profound love or unrivaled hatred in the comments section, and all I did was say the name of the game. But whether you consider it the best game ever made, or the most overrated game ever, the fact that 20 years after its release it's still relevant today only shows how much of an impact it had on gaming culture. Final Fantasy VII's original success had a lot to do with its timing and marketing. I mean, let's face it, when your game is marketed like this... More than 200 animators and programmers. A multi-million dollar production. Over two years in the making. And a cast of thousands. When other games look and played like this... can't help but sell a million copies. However, its marketing only allowed it to enter the zeitgeist. The fact that Final Fantasy VII is still remembered, and is still being discussed and dissected and debated, only shows how important it was. While not every scene can be considered <coughs> high art, we as gamers have a lot of shared experiences and memories from Final Fantasy VII. To cover every good moment of the game would take its own series of videos. So instead we're going to be looking at one of the greatest pieces of storytelling that Final Fantasy VII has to offer. Let me guess, you're going to talk about how Eris dies, right? No, not today. Oh, then you're probably going to be talking about the game's ambiguous ending. Nope, not that one either. Ah, you're going to talk about the whole quest line where Cloud cross-dresses and secretly confesses his feelings for Barrett. An appropriate foreshadowing due to how often he hides his own fears and shortcomings while wearing a disguise and is a perfect metaphor for the don't ask, don't tell culture of the late 1990s. No? So wait, what exactly are you going to be talking about? How the game totally ships Tifa and Rude together. Welcome to Building Character, an in-depth look at some of the greatest moments in gaming. And for our very special first episode, we're talking about one of the most overlooked moments in what could be the biggest RPG of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, Mogs and Chocobos, I want to talk to you about Final Fantasy VII and how Rude loves Tifa. Some of you might be wondering what the Hades I'm talking about. Well, allow me to introduce our lovebirds. Tifa Lockhart is the childhood friend of Cloud, following Yang and Sabin as the unarmed brawler of the story, and is personally one of my favorite support characters ever written. She's strong, compassionate, but also shy and reserved, often keeping things locked away in her heart. Eh? Eh? Get it? Tifa Lockhart? Because she locks away feelings in her heart? Meanwhile, Rude works for the Turks, which acts as a rival group against your main party. He's quiet, serious, and stern. Most times his dialogue consists of the writer forgetting how many periods are in ellipses. Very much like Tifa, he focuses on unarmed combat. You rarely get an opportunity to learn about his character because of how silent he is. But we do know one thing from the very few times he does talk. Rude happens to like Tifa. We know this by a conversation the party walks in on. Reno asks what kind of girl Rude likes. Rude is hesitant to answer, but after a bit more pushing, he admits his feelings. Reno states his surprise and shares a moment of understanding empathy, before deciding to provide all the shipping material fans needed to know about the Turks. It seems pretty innocuous, but this was revolutionary storytelling in video games. In the cartridge era, despite some of the greatest RPGs being made during that time, the format was a pretty difficult limitation to get over. I mean, let's face it, 4 megabytes of data is not a whole lot to work with, which was why dialogue was pretty sparse and condensed. 
the developers had to be very direct with what they were telling you, which often led to NPCs that ended up spouting expository nonsense that never feels like something a real person would say. Cecil of the Red Wing? Misty Valley is beyond the Cave of Northwest. Huh? Why is the king training the soldiers how to use the Sword of Darkseid? I don't know, beats me. Try asking him. Wow, the Dark Knight. A bit scary, but cool. You know what? You're right. That was a pretty cool movie. The CD format the PlayStation used allowed games to theoretically be as large as they want, which allowed exploration for this type of world building to occur. Now developers could design characters and explain lore in many ways that RPGs couldn't before. We might never know why Figaro Castle can travel under a desert, or the relationship between Rosa and Cecil. Cecil? Cecil? Cecil. Cecil. But with this new technology, we're able to answer these sort of questions that we would never find out without taking up that precious memory. What is Shinra? Why is Midgar surrounded by a dead wasteland? What events caused Barret to form Avalanche? Why can't the party spare a soft to give Red 13 his father back, Cloud? This made the world feel like it had a history and natural evolution. NPCs felt like they existed even when they weren't being rendered. Final Fantasy VII is filled with these voyeuristic moments, and from those moments creates a story that feels very human. And this is where it would typically end for most games. It's a brief pause of, oh, isn't that adorable, rude likes Tifa, before hitting him in the face with a nail bat. If that was it though, it probably wouldn't be worth bringing up, but it doesn't end there. This little fact carries into Rude's combat scene. Not sure what I'm talking about? But just take a look at this. Oh my god, it's Forrest. No, not, not that. The fight. Notice anything interesting? I don't mean to point out the obvious. But notice how Rude isn't attacking Tifa? Alright, let's go one step further. Let's take the other characters out of the equation. Notice how Rude is hesitant to attack Tifa. This isn't the only battle he does it in either. Anytime you have Tifa and Rude in the same battlefield, he acts the same way. Rude ignores Tifa, and when he can't ignore her, he hesitates to attack her. This is because Rude is programmed specifically not to attack Tifa. You could say he has a code of honor. Eh? Get it? Code of honor? Because it's part of his combat script? Code? Programming? Of There's this term called ludonarrative dissonance, which means that the story the game is trying to tell stands in contrast to the mechanics and design of the game itself. For example, there is this item in Final Fantasy VII that happens to be sold for the very cheap price of 150 gil each. This item is sold in places like Goganga, North Corel, and Cosmo Canyon. This item also happens to cure a very specific status effect. That just so happens to be the same one afflicting Red 13's father! Hey Sober, just let it go. It's only a game. No, I'm not gonna just let this go. That's his father, man. And you're just gonna leave him like that. Listen, everything's gonna be fine. I'm sure that- No, it's not fine. It's my- His dad. All he wants to see is his dad. He just I, needs something I, 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 to it, soften his heart. It, 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 he just wants um, to... You, you're going- I, I understand. <laughs> um, it's- Oh, jeez. Um... It's, it's okay. It's okay. For the most part in role-playing games, the story stops as soon as combat is happening. At best, the battle is a resolution of an ongoing conflict. When there is a narrative to be had in combat, it usually comes in the form of an unwinnable boss fight or its dialogue in between normal combat. In fact, Ramza, the hero of Final Fantasy Tactics, is often a reluctant fighter. He will loudly proclaim that he doesn't want this moment to end in bloodshed, often moments before the player moves and cleaves into the character he's talking to, most often just letting him bleed out in order to get those sweet job crystals.
However, this moment of combat between Tifa and Root is used to tell a narrative that very few people have seen before or really even since. Seeing this act out in front of you is telling you so much about Root as a character without telling you anything at all. We know that Root isn't just a cold-hearted assassin. We know that he's very human and has a personal conflict of interest because of his affection. In fact, in later battles he has an even greater chance at hesitating, meaning his affection has been growing as the game continues. You can start to make inferences. Maybe his silent nature isn't a result of menace, but rather insecurity. The juxtaposition of himself and Tifa being both barehanded fighters, both being poor at expressing their feelings, could be one of the reasons why Rude likes Tifa to begin with. The game tells you none of this outright, it's dependent entirely on the gameplay itself. It's an incredibly subtle way to tell a story in a game. It's the subtlety that makes this moment so profound. Because the game doesn't mention this or attempts to push this as a gameplay mechanic, this whole experience feels organic. It feels very human and real, and that only adds to the immersion, even if you consciously don't know it. And it's details like this that make you consider what other small details you might have missed. So regardless, if you love Final Fantasy VII or loathe it, it's still important to respect what it was trying to add to the conversation. All for a moment that was entirely about building character. Eh, get it? Building character? Just like the name of the show? And with that, we end our first episode of Building Character. But there are thousands upon thousands of other awesome moments in video games to dissect and pull apart. Even more than I can think of on my own. So if you have a moment that you would think would make for a great discussion, share it in the comments below and it might just be featured in a future episode. Please remember to like and subscribe, and share this with anyone you think might love in-depth analysis on video games and their design. Special thanks goes out to the cast of Midnight Marinera, including David King and Dead Palette, as well as my friend Mr. Eichhardt for providing some of their vocal talents in this video. And very special thanks to the patrons that make this show possible. If you enjoyed this video, please consider contributing. Not only does that help the show grow, but you also get exclusive behind the scenes footage and pixel art designed by me. Until next time, this is Soberdorf reminding you that gaining experience builds character.